This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 921, recorded on Wednesday, April 12th, 2023. There's bacteria in your eye. It's true. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with wolves, monkeys, and robots. But first, thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. There is a constant effort underway to understand everything. Not everyone knows this and not everyone cares. Most humans do not question the world around them. They wake up, go to work, come home, eat a quick meal, yell at the television, and go to bed. Human reality tends towards fantasy. Identity wrapped up in tribes, teams, and the products that they use. People get angry at products they identify with if the products are inclusive to other tribes. Infringing on their identity, their fantasy, and their personal brand. Such a sad existence. The brand managers and ad copywriters should be proud. Their work has had a lasting impact. There is another world taking place where people are using their minds to unlock every mystery, to observe and record every detail, to understand every interaction in a complex and intricate reality, a world where the brain is not branded by logos, where the mind is free to see and explore, to think, question, and go beyond, a world where we gather together to talk about all of the interesting things we have discovered this week in science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. Woo woo, we are back again. Blair, thank you so much for taking over with all your animals last week. Oh, you got it. It was it was extra fun. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it was wild and crazy yeah. and yeah did you hire us a new co-host is that what happened oh i did he's he's just um he's the gopher now he just brought me some water so you know he's he's demoted back down to kind of behind the scenes help but i really appreciate brian stepping in last week and doing an amazing job yeah yeah fantastic. it was fantastic fantastic i hope if People out there have not yet seen or heard the episode that they go check out last week's episode, but it is time here now for this week's episode, and we're all here ready to talk about the science that we have brought. I have eyeball evolution, fancy glasses, yeah, they're going to help you do something, brain aging that is happening, and monkey models. What do you have, Justin? Justin? I have got the dire wolf of Canada, uh, a probiotic aging story within a story. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 oh, an urgent announcement from uh, This Week in Science, dietary edition. And uh, a, tell me it's not a ritualistic ceremony. Look at old uh, ancient Europeans. Oh, that's a that's a. That's a good segment. We like to bring, we'll be bringing it back more and more. Is it? Yeah. Is it not? Let's talk about that. And Blair, what is in the yes. animal corner? We're oh, putting you back I, in the corner again. Yeah, that's fine. That's where it belongs. <laughs> um, I brought some tiger personalities and some wet birds. But before that, I also just was compelled to talk about menthol and uh, Alexa and Roomba this week. So short stories on those items, not animal related, still sparked my interest. 
It's animal I related. Really started thinking like robots smoking menthols. <laughs> yes, they're two separate stories. Although okay. who knows? Maybe we one do, day. We do know that Blair is a fan of future rom Futurama. So I mean, I don't yes. know. It's very possible that yeah. that was in there in an episode. Okay, it's time for us now to jump on in to the science. But first, oh wait, I do want to remind you that if you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, you should do that. That's right. We have a it's a podcast. It's also a broadcast. We broadcast live weekly Wednesdays 8 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. And we are podcasting just about everywhere there are podcasts to be found. Look for this week in science. We are at Twist Science on the Instagram, on the Twitch, and uh, we are also on Universidon and also the Twitter. We're there as t- at Twist Science. But, you know, go to twist.org if you need any more information. You can find all sorts of things at our website. Now it's time for the science. Let's start with your eyeballs. Where'd they come from? How did... Your head? <laughs> well, they're in our heads, but where oh, okay. did they come from? How did we get the vertebrate eye? How did we get these camera-like eyeballs with their many molecular sequences that lead to the changing of light energy into electrochemical energy that allows us to see? How do we how did we get there? Right? Well, I can can I, well, I can only go back as far as fish. As far as fish, but those are there were some vertebrate then, fish, right? Then it's blurry. Yeah, fish are vertebrates. <laughs> Yeah, there were some, there were some, there are definitely vertebrate fish in there. But researchers have been looking at all of the molecules in the eye and they're like, hmm, this is a complex thing. And if you know people who like to argue against the idea of evolution leading to how we got here and instead try to uh, discuss the idea of intelligent design, there is often the idea brought up of the human eye, the vertebrate eye is so complex that there's no way that it evolved on its own. You that, know why that, that falls apart immediately? Cephalopods. They also have a camera like <laughs> eye. It has evolved twice. It is convergent evolution. That Therefore, means- certainly possible. Certainly possible. But their camera like eye that does that work. That the threshold, the, just the threshold for what's too complicated <laughs> yes. for That's- the folks who are making those arguments usually includes a lot more than just the eye. <laughs> There's usually a lot much, more in there, but the eye is everything. Yeah, yeah. the eye is, is one of the science things. Science is in that category. <laughs> so, uh, the vertebrate eye, yeah, it is pretty complicated. There are lots of uh, of mechanical steps, lots of little tiny molecules in the eye that go flip, 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 and they they have to go up one place and change structure, and then they have to be brought back to another place to go back to their original structure. So the light comes in, and the, the molecules go. Bah! And they change their structure and then something has to put them back so that they can go again and so that the whole thing can happen. Well, researchers have been trying to figure out, okay, where did all of these different molecules come from? And many of them we can see have been part of eye evolution for a very, very, very long time. But what is the thing that makes the vertebrate eye the vertebrate eye? And so researchers at the uh, UC San Diego have been trying to find parts of these molecular sequences that are special. And they per- looked at one particular molecule called interphotoreceptor retinoid binding protein. They looked at the genes for this in the human eye. They found that there were like four copies of it in the human vertebrate eye and at other vertebrates. And they traced it back and they discovered that um, there were some bacteria that had this gene, this protein before us. And the interesting thing about this is that they suggest that this bacterial gene came to be in the vertebrate eye through a a jump, horizontal gene transfer from bacteria to vertebrates. And it was the jump of this gene that allowed suddenly the rhodopsin, the retinal pigment, pig, pigments, the rhodopsins to change structure when they get excited. And then the 
interphotoreceptor, uh, blah, 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 IRBP, it would take the, the pigment and put it back in the structure that it's supposed to be back in. So this is a very important protein and they couldn't figure out where it came from. It just suddenly appeared in the vertebrate eye and the genetic story that they are telling is that it came from horizontal gene transfer for bacteria. Yeah. Now, in bacteria, in the genomes of the bacteria that they've been looking at, uh, it only appears usually once. And like I said, there are four copies of it in the vertebrate system. And so what they're guessing it happened is that it maybe had a different function in the bacterial cell and then transferred over and then wasn't really doing anything and maybe it got copied again and it got copied again and copied again. and eventually it started leading to this function and the molecule the IR irbp was it it became a thing through evolution and it is suggested these researchers think that oh maybe it you know when it moved into vertebrates that it became important and this is what it did in the vertebrate eye mm -hmm. other researchers say hey that's nice cool that you found this bacterial uh gene and protein that's that's cool but like it could have been a total accident <laughs> and maybe it just made the eye work better Totally accidental, right? <laughs> just, oh, we copied it and suddenly it has a function that didn't do bad. So it worked. You got your bacteria in my eyeball. You got your eyeball in my bacteria. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So these researchers, they dug into IRBP and all these uh, these domains and the bacterial family trees. They did a bunch of phylogenies and uh, they really determined that this is common all among all vertebrates and that's it it is not so like the we have to look at the octopus eye which you say yes. is, the cephalopod still has camera vision but do they have this protein and does it work that way right. so far uh the evidence does not suggest that it does or would wow. that's awesome i can't wait to find out more yeah 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 so anyway yeah our eyes vertebrates we're special because we got a bacteria in our eye heck yeah <laughs> Yeah, got some bacteria. That's awesome. Yeah. Tell me a story, Justin. Oh, where are we, where are we starting here? So this is, uh, I guess I'm starting with this one. This is uh, one of these kinds of stories that we've brought quite a bit of, especially during the, the pandemic. We have, we have researchers who are sitting around twiddling their thumbs in Canada, wondering, oh, what should our next project be? And then they realized, hey, there's a whole bunch of stuff in drawers that was collected a long time ago that nobody's identified in a paper. And so they went digging through. About a year ago, they discovered in this one collection, of this medicine hat uh, dig site, that they had somebody had collected this Smilodon, this saber-toothed oh. cat. It is the the only one that has been found in Canada. Huh. And so, okay, well, hey, let's, they wrote a paper about it, identified it, and then, you know, it was like, hey, that was fun. Sitting around, twiddling thumbs again. And I said, <laughs> yeah, there's <laughs> other stuff the in it. Yeah. Let's go back into that same, that same box, those boxes from that same site. And they found a Canadian dire wolf. And the, the dire wolf is uh, an extinct cousin to the wolf, not an ancestor. Bigger than uh, the modern day gray wolf uh, and and has a tendency to overlap in territories with saber-toothed cats. You find them in, in North America, South America. They've even been found in, in Ch China. So so they went through and they did the, at the very, th the fossils weren't in great condition. They, they're, you know, it's possible that the, the, when they were first discovered, they were identified, and when they were first discovered, they were identified as dire wolf. But there, no official paper was ever written about it, much like the Smilodon. Ah, we think that's what we've got there, but we're not going to publish on it. What's interesting, I thought, is that in the first study, they just went and published on it, and they, they found it. In this study, they found the original author, and he was he's also or the original uh, person to describe it unofficially in a report. And included them on the study. So they got to finally publish on this. But uh, yeah, after a thorough analysis, it firmly fell within the range 
of Direwolf, putting it, uh, you know, hundreds of miles north of where the 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 any other direwolf had been found. And it also points out that uh, I guess a year or two, or two years ago, three years ago now, there was northern China had discovered direwolves there, which also then. And this is about 40,000 years, 45,000 year old hmm. uh, fossil, which also suggests a time when they were able to travel back and forth. Because this is, this is uh, uh, also within the, the, these, this fossil find the site, there are camels, uh, bison, horses. There's all sorts of things that we're not used to seeing really far north uh, in Canada. This is, this is south of the Saskatchewan River, which for those of you not familiar with Canada, you got the, some of the cities you might recognize on the East Coast, Quebec. You got the West Coast. You got, you know, Vancouver. People have heard that. And then there's the whole middle of Canada. Which, <laughs> uh, so it's, 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 it's not as far north as, as Manitoba. Uh-huh. But right. since nobody knows where Manitoba is, it, it just kind of defies... The purpose of the description. <laughs> it's up there, basically. It's somewhere in the middle yeah. of a big country that in, a, in an area where, where uh, there's more moose than people. Well, that sounds like a, an attractive place for a dire wolf to go. Yeah. Lots of food. Think, yeah, but I, I love the timing of it, too, because it suggests that maybe they were, there was a corridor and maybe they were following food mammoths and other creatures that were going back and forth and maybe 40,000 years ago to 25,000 years ago so, or so. A, there was yeah. a window of time there was uh, frozen, at, at, at the 40, yeah. 45,000 years ago. There was a window yeah. of time when when we're not in Ice Age. Like we had a little mini one before that mm-hmm. and then this is, you know, before the, the really big one sets in mm-hmm. or as it's, you know, growing. And so we also know that horses, that uh, wild horses had been traveling back and forth. And it's interesting yeah. that there was so much turnover at that last ice age where a lot of things didn't make it. Uh-huh. That last ice age like the dire really wolves. changed quite a bit. Mammoths. It's also, you know, there's part of this that makes me wonder why this wasn't published. Because this is like the first smiling on, the first dire wolf. And well, we'll, we'll put in a report, but we're not going to publish this is also, I think, around the time when the earliest evidence of humans and Beringia were being found mm-hmm. to be about 20,000 years ago. Yep. And that guy did publish. And that guy got ridiculed. Uh, Jean uh, Marx, uh, I'm going to mess up his name because I'm doing it off the. But, hmm. <laughs> so maybe they're like, yeah, let's not be first. Right. I don't I mean, know. I, there comes a certain point if you've done it before and you've been through it, you're like, ugh. You know, maybe I'll just keep it to myself until there's more evidence, until somebody else comes up with something. But yeah, just the size of these, of the the fossils that they found, it's, they're so cool. And that's neat. What a wonderful find. We may have crossed paths. The, there was my yeah. point, the, the first people coming into the Americas, you know, uh, if they were beaten the Ice Age, which is, which is what a, kind of now a more prevailing theory is some of them might have gotten here before the Ice Age kicked in completely. That's when this fella was traveling around up there, too. Uh, oh, would have loved to see ancient man battling the dire wolf. No, or not battling. Left, no, Or the running. leftover scraps of mammoth. <laughs> trying, to, trying desperately to avoid... No fighting. Yes, no fighting. No fight. We don't like fighting. Uh-uh. Domesticating the dire wolf? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Possibly. Losing fingers in the process? Yeah. Do tell. Yes. We aren't domesticating, but we do like to have a little bit of fresh mint flavor every once in a while. Oh, yes. Uh, tell me what's up with mint. Yeah. yeah, if you vape or smoke. Uh, this is from the University of Pittsburgh, and they found that adding mint flavor to e-cigarette liquids produce more vapor particles and are associated with worse lung function in those who smoke. Um, mint and methyl, despite kind of the, the push to reduce flavored e-cigarettes and vape options in the United States, they're still really popular. There's about two and a half million youth who reported smoking e-cigarettes in 20, 
22 alone. And so um, these flavored vaping situations still persist. And it turns out that the mint, mint slash menthol flavor is actually really bad for you. Uh, they Before they went, uh, uh, went with kind of mouse or human studies, they were actually able to make a d- robotic system that mimics the mechanics of human breathing and vaping. So they were able to pump different kind of vapors into that. And they showed that commercially available e-cigarette liquids that contained menthol generated a greater number of toxic nanoparticle or microparticles, excuse me, compared to menthol free. And that uh, when menthol vapors were taken in, there were shallower breaths. There was poor lung function compared to non-menthol smokers. That was regardless of age, gender, race, pack years of smoking, or the use of nicotine or cannabis containing vaping products. So the long and short of it is smoking is bad for you. Vaping is not much better. (laughs) Mint and menthol, really bad. So stay away from that stuff. But I want to, menthol has always been considered bad, right? Like when right. We, I think when we've the heard about is, menthol cigarette, cigarettes, they're like, ooh, menthol cigarettes, they yeah. sell them to get more people to smoke cigarettes, but then those are really bad for you. And why would right. menthol vaping be any better? Right. I, and I think menthol was really popular in like the 80s and 90s. And then they kind of they they put out this information and people stopped using it. But now it's inching back in because of flavored mm-hmm. e-cigarettes and vape, vape pens. And so be, part of what creates the flavor, the different flavors is menthol. And so it's bringing menthol back into the fold of the smoking conversation, which is a huge bummer. But it's an important time to remind everybody that menthol is really bad for you. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, is it, I, I feel is, like I feel like this is on the borderline of, of of you know if you're if if you're gonna smoke crack, don't use a tin foil pipe because that one will print at like just don't smoke. What is wrong with people? Yeah, that's the that is definitely the first step. Don't smoke. It's, yeah. Well, and I think part of this is um, that vaping was kind of brought to the table as this miraculous alternative alternative. And the more we learn about it, the worse it actually is. It's not this miracle alternative that is infinitely better than cigarettes. There's all sorts of these other problems, not to mention the fact that the marketing of this better alternative was actually a backdoor to be able to market to children again. So that's a whole nother issue because yeah. of the or flavors. teens but yeah young youngs the young it's i mean you can say that that the unicorn flavored vape pen is for teens but it might oh. actually be for kids younger than that i'm just saying um regardless wait a second <laughs> yeah i didn't know there was such a thing oh if you look at vape <laughs> no. flavors they are all over like unicorn sparkle pink oh. and like They do all sorts of crazy things to come up with flavors that are appealing to children. That is what they do. That's that's nefarious. So yeah, but stay away from the mint. Is all I'm saying. Bad. It's it's bad for the cells in the in in the lungs themselves, right? It's not just yeah. It's yeah. yeah. Not just the uh, the compound that's used for the smoke. It's the mint also that's bad. Thanks. Well, I won't be doing that anytime soon. Good. Thanks. And I hope you don't either. Um, Something that uh, is an interesting question is how do babies grow in the bellies of, I mean, in in the uterus? How do they grow? It's too complicated. (laughs) Therefore, religion. (laughs) <laughs> well that does come into play in this study that we're gonna well, discuss I, right now yeah i do but think not, it has to do with sucking the lice es- es- essence out of the mother <laughs> i do think that's part of it <laughs> you you may be currently slightly biased blair um, i mean i wouldn't be one to say uh, so in this particular study that was published in Cell Stem Cell, researchers were trying to figure out a new way to be able to really look at the developmental gestational process of the embryo. So the blastocyst stage to the embryonic stage. Now, with, with humans, it's fraught. 
with a lot of ethical issues. So stem cells, we originally had embryonic stem cells. And if you've been around a while, you remember that there was a big hubbub about whether or not embryonic stem cells were going to be allowed to be, uh, be used in research. And there were 60 stem cell lines that were, uh, made, that were okayed by then President George Bush and, uh, and Congress. And the rest of them, it was like, nope, we can't use any more of those embryonic human, human embryonic cells. No more, because we can't take those cells because that is fraught with issues with uh, ethics related to the religious, some religious parts of the religious community and others as well. So then people said, oh, but pluripotent stem cells. If we can train skin cells or, you know, hair cells or whatever, if we can train them to going back to their baby state, maybe then that'll let us know what's going on. But we found out that there is are there are differences, essential differences between embryonic stem cells and pluripotent stem cells that have been told to go back to that embryonic light state. They're not exactly the same and they don't progress in the same way. So there are different different molecular signaling cascades that are in play. There are different different cellular factors that are in play in these cells during the the blastoid blastocyst early gestational pr uh, part of the process. Now, so we can't go into people and be like, hey, how's your baby doing? You know, because that would interrupt the process. You can't use the embryonic stem cells. The pluripotent stem cells are okay, but they're not doing great. And there's only so far that we can go looking at mice and rats who are not really related to people that closely. Pretty closely, but there's enough, there are lots of differences. So these researchers said, hey, primates, let's see what we can do about primates. And in this study, they, uh, they presented their work in getting macaque monkeys, synomolgus monkeys, uh, and using their embryonic stem cells to create blastoids, which is the very early, early ball cluster of the embryo when you've had the, the fertilized egg that has split and split and split, and you suddenly have eight cells instead of just a single cell. Um, that's where you have your blastoid. Now, the blastoid with these embryonic stem cells, they followed it. They're like, oh, can we look at it in a dish? Look at it go. They're growing. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Woo woo, go, blastoid embryos, go. Grow, grow, grow. And that was very exciting. And then they were like, okay, now we need to take a look at these blastoids in vivo in a uh, in an IVF situation. So they uh, they transplanted the these blastoids into mother monkeys to see what would happen. And lo and behold, all of the hormones were just right in the macaque's uterus and the blood of the mother was spouting off all the right hormones. The blastoids progressed to the phase that's called gastrulation, which is where they start to create a, a little, little dent in them. Like they get a, they get, start to, they want to turn into a little donut, basically. Mm. So the blastocyst, they followed it to the gastrula. And so this was very exciting because they showed that they could get to a previously not documented stage of de gestational development. And they did that. It, it implanted. These blastoids implanted in the primate uterus. Everything was working just great. And the only reason they didn't make little macaque babies was because they, their protocol didn't ask for that and they just wanted to know if it was going to work. So what they've said in effect is, look at what we've done. We have created a new model system that gets around a lot of the ethical quandaries related to human embryonic stem cells and allows us a new model to be able to understand gestational development that we have never been able to really see before. So, nice. Yes. Cool. Go researchers, go. And I, you know, I find it exciting that I, and I'm sure somebody's done it before, you know, you know, implanting monkeys, IVF mm -hmm. implanting monkeys, but not with the research focus. I find it, fa I find it interesting that at this time after, yeah, you know, we haven't really talked about embryonic stem, stem cells for a very long time. They've kind of fallen off the fad, right? It's all pluripotent, but 
now we've got organoids, but organoids only go so far. Mm -hmm. So there, there has to be a middle ground. And no, well, yeah, me <laughs> macaques are a lot closer to us than mice. So that's an exactly. excellent test model. Absolutely. It is. I mean, there are still going to be ethical issues. Animal research, you're not, you know, there are still issues, but it is uh, not as fraught as the hu completely human situation. So, yeah, maybe we'll learn more about how babies are made in the, in the belly. Yeah, let's see. Moving, when was uh, when was this ban? It was about twenty years ago or more. Yeah. So that's so that's just just put the yeah. research off track by twenty years. Twenty years. That's all. Oh, no that's big deal. Yeah. No, no big, big deal, deal at all. Yeah. Back on track. Love it. <sighs> We're all on track. We're on track to age gracefully. Yeah, Justin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, well, let's see. So this is actually a very interesting study by uh, by uh, Chinese researchers. They all uh, are work for or associated with this, uh, this same probiotic company in some way. They they studied. You know, we we talk quite a bit about the microbiota connection to health these days, understanding how the gut microbes influence the brain and the the metabolic systems. So they decided to look at some of the world's healthiest people, people who were centenarians, people over 100 years old, and study their, their microbiome up close. So they, uh, they went to a, a region in China that is known for having exceptionally old people. And researchers studied the microbiome of 297 people who were from uh, between the ages of 100 and 117 years old and compared them with different groupings of people from the, you know, the 20s, up in the 40s, the 50s and 60s. They had these five different groups and they, they looked at their, their microbiomes. And they found that the overall structure, the evenness of distribution and diversity was most similar uh, with the centenarians and the young adults in the ages 20 to 44 years. Why does that not surprise me? Like so much of our like, go drink the, the blood of the young people. Like, <laughs> I mean, if you're aging that well and you haven't gotten into your senescent phase, like you're going to, right, be healthier all around, right? This is yeah. interesting. Okay. Yeah, so... So, uh, so this is in the Gongji province, uh, where these folks come from, and they've they're they're renowned. They had the oldest person in the world at one point, uh, possibly the oldest person who's ever lived, at 127 years old. Wow. Now, officially, they're not the oldest person in the world. Officially, Guinness Book Guinness Book of World Records went to go and verify oldest mm. person in the world. They were dead by the time they got there. Yeah, uh, no, actually, this Sorry, I think this no. is when the person was 125, because that oh. was uh, the the current record is I think 122, 122, maybe 125. Did it predate birth certificates? <laughs> so yeah, that, <laughs> birth certificates. This is a very rural farming community area of China, and birth certificates didn't show up till 1949. And in fact, most people didn't get IDs for decades after that. And in this case, had gotten an ID at some point, but that was the only one. It didn't get updated any, at any point. So it was this old video. And it was also kind of interesting because the woman had given birth to her son at the age of, must have been 61. No. Yeah. So, which, which was not even the story <laughs> at the time. Which would have been a big story. It would have been. I just want everyone, while you're just for a quick pause, I just would like all the podcast listeners to imagine Blair's round saucer eyes at the concept of being pregnant so, at 61. Anyway. So, <laughs> there are cultural differences between East and West. In China, there is a higher status for people of older age. Uh -huh. and less of an obsession to focus on youth. 
So you have everybody in this study, in fact, current study, over the age of 72 would have had to have self-identified, self-reported their age at some point when an ID came about. When somebody came down and was like, oh, we're going to give everybody an ID of some form. That could have been in the 70s. That could have been in the 80s. They could have been, you know, 30, 40, 50, who knows? And the, the, to, to keep this off the focus off of China for a second, my own, in going back and doing ancestry research, I discovered that one of my grandmothers, between the, the, the census, which would take place every 10 years, would only age eight to seven years. Right. <laughs> if she was 25 in one census, she was 32 in the next, and then only turned 40 the next time they came around. Another My grandmother, I think she was about 70 when she started counting backwards. <laughs> so <laughs> every birthday after, she got younger. <laughs> so, so another thing is, I don't know if anybody had noticed, currently the oldest person on the planet is 116. They did a study on aging where they had somebody who reported being 117 years old, and that was not the focus of the story or their study. The oldest person in the world wandered into a study on aging. Nobody mentions it. So part of this <laughs> So part of this is a problem. Part of this is just sort of a China problem because China also has a, a good amount of mythology built up around people who who work in these farming communities uh, uh, area who you know work from morning to night and get good night's sleep and that's how they live a a long life there's another problem with this study i found which is that everybody working on this study is connected to a probiotic company which also creates a detection system Uh, by detecting what your microbiome is and while at the end of this study, the researchers say there's important clues here that could help us develop uh, and we're going to isolate the different bacteria and test them in animals because we think there could be a pathway to creating a probiotic for anti-aging longevity mm. within this cohort, which is interesting because that is something that the company that they work for already sells. Oh, my. Already has claimed to be providing probiotics that reverse aging and prolong life. So, so this study has a, has several issues. Uh, yeah. I mean, so and, the, and, the, know, the, we, the number one take home is, OK, maybe the aging, you know, the cohorts, the youngest and oldest. The co- they have sharing. an unverified, completely unverified yeah. cohort Eight. of centenarians. Oh. Right, one. not verified. They have conflicts yeah. of interest too, and it's yeah. published in a very shady uh, sounding journal, Nature Aging. I don't know if uh, any of this has very much prominence anywhere uh, in the world, but well, it's nature. It's nature. I and, know. Uh, and you can it's access nature. you can access this article for thirty nine ninety five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A bargain. <laughs> Yeah, what a deal! <laughs> it's, so, you, it's, if, if you add uh, six monthly payments of nine ninety nine, you'll get the supplements also. Yeah, so it's it's one of these interesting. <laughs> like I'm not I'm not trying to bash on Chinese research, but there's certain areas where research meets uh, culture propaganda. and propaganda. Yeah, and the propaganda is that people of this region live to an exceptionally long age. You also can't really. This is why there's there's a tremendous amount of artifacts found for early hominins uh, throughout China. But the reason we probably don't hear a lot of them reported is because the 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 propaganda that goes with all of the anthropology in China is that the Chinese people are a separate people that evolved separately from the rest of us, hmm. and that this is the evidence. And that's why we don't probably hear a whole lot about the anthropology coming out of China is because it has to get through the state filter. And so this is another situation, I think, where there's a filter. Otherwise, or I mean, I could be totally wrong. And the oldest person on the planet wandered into a study on aging and nobody mentioned it. Nobody. 
There are a lot of people in China. I mean, probability wise, probability it's wise, it should be China that has yeah, the oldest yeah. people, right? But, but it, it, well, if it it's not verified, you think about it because it's not verifiable. Well, but they listed it. Can can and, you really go and and make an entire side point of your study about how you have the oldest person in the world if you have no proof? Right. Well, and, and can you can you claim that you're studying 200 and something centenarians when you cannot you don't verify really their age at all? Right. Yeah. And how, so how do you how do you differentiate them from younger age groups from, you know, mm-hmm. so are your age are your age groups accurate at all? anybody over 72 yeah. years old? And there's two co- uh, there's two cohorts there that they they are cohorts. There's two groupings of age above that before they got to centenarian that they cannot verify age <laughs> and there's plenty the, of places the in the age. world yeah uh the yeah, oldest sure. woman in the world right now I th- actually i think she's in california she was born in san francisco in the early 1900s where there were records kept you know, there's people born in france in england in sweden you can go back to the 1800s uh for some of these folks easily or, and have perfectly good uh government kept records of birth this rural farming community in China is not on that list, but will be, will be in about 26 years. Yeah. 23, 23 years. Is that right? But until then, 26 years, in 26 years, we can begin to identify centenarians from this region, but not before. <laughs> but not before. And in the meantime... Yeah, just take the probiotics you've got and don't necessarily trust the company well, promote com- company funded study yeah. that probably finds a thing. And yeah, that's, so this is this is I, I, I know I'm taking too much time with the story, but this is also going to be a problem because as much as like Blair, you've been talking about, I want to have my microbiome diagnosed. Do you remember Merck and uh, osteopenia? Mm-hmm. Yes. Where Merck a whole created a, de- a bone yeah. detection device that uh, created a, a, a non-osteoporosis diagnosis that recommended a drug that Merck made. Yes. This is the this is this funnel that this, this study this here study reminded thing. me of where you are diagnosing based on a definition of, in this case, evenness study. And I have a machine that can tell people this is what you've got. And also pr- provides the solution. There's a problem with that, and there's not any regulation that I've seen yet because probiotics seems to be falling into the supplement category. Absolutely, at which this is point incredibly in time. dangerous, yeah. seeing as how the gut microbiome we now know can affect so many things in human health and cognition, mm-hmm. and yeah, the connections brain, are yeah. everywhere. Mm-hmm. That food is regulated, but a transfer of microbiome is not. Yep. And I do I do wonder about the diets of the young people that they included in this study. I mean, if they're like the typical college student, I mean, I mean, it's a different diet entirely in China, of course, but in the United States, it's usually going to be some form of cheap junk food, which isn't necessarily uh, going to lead to a very healthy microbiome. Huh. <laughs> I don't know if you really do want the microbiome of a young person. This is a good question to be asking. Is it the microbiome or is it the diet? It's, we, know, we know it's a combination of the two. Or, 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 or should, should there be another look at this study? There should be. Differently. Or should there be a, a replication, a, Let's a replication, replication. Uh, yes. somewhere else of this study before anybody follows anything that was produced by it? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Blair, would you listen to your mm. kids? Would you listen to your kids if they if they were telling you how to treat a robot? Uh, I think that you should. Uh, I love the story that came out this week from Duke University where they, they interviewed four to 11-year-olds about Alexa and Roomba. Uh, they recruited 127 children. They were visiting a science museum at the time and they watched a 20-second clip of Alexa and a 20 second clip of of the Roomba. Then they were asked questions about the device. They found that neither Roomba nor Alexa deserve to be yelled at or harmed. (laughs) But those feelings dwindled as they got older, which is interesting. Um, They also recognized that Alexa was more human like 
than Roomba. And they were more likely to as- kind of prescribe emotions to Alexa than they were to Roomba. So it was definitely related okay. to the fact that she talks, of course. Um, they both just, de- they decided that uh, both Alexa and Roomba probably aren't ticklish, probably wouldn't feel pain if they got pinched. They probably can't feel physical sensations like people do, but they gave Alexa, as opposed to Roomba, high marks for mental and emotional capabilities, like being able to think or getting upset if someone was mean to it. Um, So the part where this kind of starts to fall apart a little bit (laughs) is that in in the study, one 10-year-old said it was not okay to yell at technology because, quote, the microphone sensors might break if you yell too loudly. Hmm. Whereas another 10 year old said, That's a, I was, like that. I, I yes. like the nice uh, logical approach. Yes. Another 10 year old said it was not okay because quote, the robot will feel really sad. So Aww. this is the other question is, is it that you shouldn't hit or be mean to these things because they're property and it'd be morally wrong because it might break as somebody's mm. property or is it because they deserve fair treatment? So I think more more study is required, but ultimately there seemed to be a parallel between children's understanding that they shouldn't hit each other, shouldn't hit other people, and you shouldn't hit Roomba or Alexa. So, so this is an important question as we explore the world of AI, as machines yeah. get more and more... Um, agency i will say yeah and um and the question is then beyond what children think are appropriate knowing what might be in our future Mm. as adults should we model good behavior in the way that we talk to siri or chat gpt or the roomba or alexa i think so but i'm terrified that it's going to be uh learning from the masses Right. Yeah. So that's the other question is like, sure, these things <laughs> aren't going to respond in a particular way because of how you treat them now. But as we learn more and more about these AIs and safeguards are kind of hopefully carefully being removed, they're showing some preference, some of these chatbots. And um, as preference develops, do personalities develop? Do these things happen where... You know, it matters how you treat this technology. And are toddlers and and um, and young children kind of ahead of the game with us on this one? Are we going to get left well, in the dust where the AI will take side. care of us because we're rude to them? And is it and is it both at the same time? Yes, we can always model good behavior. Yes. We can always be what you know a, a model of what we want to see our children doing in the world right but they're going to be getting information and modeling from others in their environment yeah. as well so you're not the only one unless you're all alone having your baby in a house by yourself with nobody else and no internet or anything ever you know there there are other influences yeah. on your children that you can't control but yeah. then additionally there is there's the fine line of also teaching your children that Hey, this is a, you know the Roomba, Roomba moves, but it's it, it's right. a robot. The Alexa is you know might be talking to you, but it's a computer program that's figuring out the best answer to, right. to tell you. Right, and is it it's, especially it's, important to yeah. draw that line because children yeah. should not inherently trust AI exactly. at least right now because the truthfulness issue is still a huge problem. Right, so like. And AI still also doesn't have morality safeguards where like they might suggest yeah. a bad thing to somebody. Yeah. So there's all sorts of concerns so there. I, I, I think the toddlers are aware of it. If you listen to their answers, what, what they said, the dark side of this is that they believe that the AI or whatever, the robot can have its feelings hurt and that it cannot feel pain. And what is a more frightening yeah, really. thing that you could conceive of, of something that's angry with you and cannot be hurt. Oh, yeah, that's no good. <laughs> no. So that's the scary. other thing I was thinking about with this, together. too, is like, as, as we continue, especially with chatbots on the scene, will there be a time at which you're not 100% sure if you're talking to or typing to or interacting Absolutely. with a yes. human or an AI. You won't know the difference. Yes. And so you have to treat 
all of those things like you are talking to a human because you don't know i all i already do that (laughs) i already i'm like i don't know (laughs) yeah i'm talking to this live chat on chewy where i buy my dog's dog food and i need to make sure that i'm friendly and nice and i ask how their day is because they could be an ai or they could be a human i don't know (laughs) And, you know, you always want to err on the side of caution, you know, world robot domination and all. Be nice yes. to the future overlords. and But yes. at the same time, teach your children how to stand up and talk back to them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. What will yeah. tomorrow bring? I don't even know. But the kids seem to get it. That's well, the, this, the kids, the kids are getting it. The kids are smarter than everybody thinks. Uh, so the what will what will tomorrow bring? Well, this month brings new fancy glasses for people who um, potentially want to just have the glasses read their lips. These fancy glasses are AI equipped, and they are also equipped with what they're calling Echo Speech. And these glasses, they've gotten off the shelf eyeglasses for this experiment out of Cornell's sci fi lab, Smart Computer Interfaces for Future Interactions. I love the name of their lab, the sci fi lab. Um, they have trained an AI, a very simple artificial intelligence algorithm, to use sonar that is emitted by little microphones on the eyeglasses to then record the reflections of that sound in speak like in microphones that are also in the glasses and use the sonar technique to be able to determine how your face is moving to read your lips so that you can just wear a pair of eyeglasses and be able to send a text do simple compute computer commands Um, They've so far trained it up in some 30 or so uh, commands that they that the eyeglasses can read. So in the future, if you see somebody moving their lips and no sound coming out, what they are doing is silent speaking for their Ah. echo speech glasses that are powered by sonar. That is Interesting and bizarre. This is not where I thought this was going. I thought it was actually going to go in a different direction, which I suppose is the next logical step and may already be doable, which is if you had glasses that could read lips and would tell you what people were saying as you so looked that's, at them. Right. So that's the that's another potential future, right? Being able to determine the facial movements of other people. These are currently it's you train it so you yeah. go through the the training commands and train the ai and it's um, using sonar but, of your yeah. face sonar of your face yeah to <laughs> translate that's amazing yeah yeah so they've used uh this lab has come up with a bunch of different desi- designs they've got some wearable earbuds that do another uh acoustic sensing technique that also tracks facial movements they've made like a a a necklace a pendant that uses infrared and they also trained it up to do sonar as well so that you'd have a necklace looking with the pendant looking up at your face and you uh using the movements of your face to again command um another device um and uh, originally when they'd started this whole line of engineering technology development they were looking at cameras but they determined that cameras use too much battery power um, and also there's a lot of data involved and so if you want to protect your privacy without having to send your data up to the cloud to be analyzed by an algorithm these devices the battery life on the eyeglasses lasts almost an entire day and additionally it can be uh connected wirelessly to your smartphone and the smartphone does all the processing the alg is an app that the ai is an app that runs on your phone and can help you interact it you know with your phone or with a computer or with other devices and um yeah the, the, the thing is it's such a specific need i'm trying to like place cameras this over 
Yeah. But, no, I mean, I mean, I mean, the only thing I could think of so far was wanting to take a note in a class without making sound mm-hmm. or texting on your device because that seems like that's just as, like <laughs> instead you're just copying what somebody else has said after they say it without yeah, actually saying with, the with things they said out loud and with way. your lips yeah <laughs> and then do people make a like a uh, like a sub vocal sound while they're doing it, like. <laughs> so I'm sure people do make a sub vocalizing sound as well, and so that's another question: is why not just use sub vocalizations to be able to use these commands? Um, the it's idea. Clever. It's very clever. I just don't know. Yeah, I mean, the idea uh, for who it would be for is this could potentially be the kind of technology that would help people who. Um, you know, can't produce speech. Uh, maybe there's or text. whatever or <laughs> or text. Maybe there is some reason that they need to be silent, uh, and sub vocalization would be picked up for some. I don't. I don't know. Um, some specific examples that they brought up were very simple ones, such as you wanting to uh, send a message to um, a waitress in a, a crowded cafe or or restaurant, or maybe you're wanting to send a text to your friend, um, but it's very loud, so you can't actually have a conversation. But so you can face to speech text. Or you can them. text them. This sounds yeah. like James Bond stuff to it me. It is James Bond Honestly. stuff. It's gonna be great. That's what it sounds. That's the best <laughs> application, as I can see it. Spy stuff. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Well, this uh, this will be helpful at least for any of us who get uh, accidentally uh, frozen and then thought out into the future and then we take public not. transit and see a bunch of people. Yeah mouthing things we'll, just, we'll understand what's the fu- what's really going on the future is just gonna get weirder socially people i mean it was weird at first when people were walking down the street talking to themselves oh jitter jatter just- jibber jabber everywhere <laughs> now they're gonna be talking to themselves but not making any sound while I do it. it yeah, it's gonna be well because then this is this is the the mediary step right this is when the people got the earbuds People then it just seemed like there was crazy people also talking to each uh, themselves because they didn't have the phone, so you didn't know that they were in a conversation with somebody. So you always had it like, is that a, somebody talking to themselves, or is that somebody who's on the phone? And then, then people started texting, and the silence. Oh, the silence that fell over the earth. <laughs> Except for those people, people who have like the other. their sound on and oh. the responsive texting, so it's. <laughs> Yeah, I think that it's used to be a sounds. default, right? I don't think <laughs> yeah, it is anymore. <laughs> yeah. That's so anyway. Inter- <laughs> iterative stage. Be nice to Alexa and Roomba, and also the future is going to be full of sonar glasses that read your face. Ah. <sighs> Fun stuff, everybody. This is This Week in Science. We hope that you are enjoying the show. And if you are enjoying the show, please tell a friend about it today. If you're really enjoying the show, please head over to our website, twist.org, and click on the Patreon link. Patreon is how we fund the show. We are listener-supported. So listeners, viewers like you, you can help us maintain Twist and keep on going every week bringing you a new episode. You head over to Patreon, click on that link at twist.org and join our little community there. Choose your amount of support. $10 and more per month. We read your name at the end of the show. $15 and more per month. You get stickers. Woo! There's other fun prizes as well. Yay, join the club. Be a part of keeping twists in your ears and in front of your faces. We thank you for your support. We really can't do this without you. All right. Time to come on back to this last part of the show. We're going to start off this segment with what the whole show was last week. Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, She's your girl, except for giant pandas and squirrels. What you got, Blair? 
Oh man, I have a special Blair's Animal Corner edition of We Needed a Study for That? <clears throat> Here we go. <laughs> Turns out a study published this week reveals that tigers have individual personalities. They've got personality. Personality. Why why was it just now uh, fat what? Mm-hmm. So there's the there's the kind of the the press coverage of the story there's the actual story okay. but on the whole it does seem like the point of this study was to see if there are personality trait differences in individual tigers and how that impacts their survivability oh okay as someone who has worked with wild animals of many kinds from like fish <laughs> all the way to monkeys and apes animals have personalities in fact we have had studies on the show about things like fish and how their personalities impact the kind of the social ecology of the group and all sorts of things so spiders have personalities yes spiders have individual personalities so mm-hmm. all that aside so this study <laughs> The, the point of it was, really, they wanted to know um, if the differences in tiger personalities, are there evidences of personality dimensions, something analogous to what's called the big five in human personality research, which I had to look up. I wasn't super up to date on this, but it's uh, followed by the, the acronym OCEAN, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So they are used for you to kind of understand yourself. And researchers have found that there's a science to human personality, regardless of gender, age, nationality, whatever. It's all made out of these five basic traits. And so you can take a quiz and figure out your score in each of these areas and how that kind of impacts you and all this stuff. It's it's very analogous to sounding to me like the Myers-Briggs stuff and you know, all the different kind of personality tests you can take to understand yourself. But basically they wanted to see if there were dimensions that they could measure in tigers that they could then associate with measurable outcomes like group status, health, mating frequency, all this kind of stuff. So we don't need a study to know that tigers have personality traits and that that impacts them. I'm going to say that. (laughs) But what they wanted to do and they ended up doing was measuring things well enough to be able to identify specific personality traits and how those impact tigers. So that potentially has value. So did they, yeah. So did they come up with any um, take homes related to? Yeah. And, and and this is like the other weird asterisk I have on this study is the way that they did it is they, they looked at 248 Siberian tigers or Amur tigers But the way that they tested them was through a personality test on their caregivers. So it was a questionnaire with a list of 70 personality indicators filled out by veterinarians, feeders, and other caretakers who work with tigers in the semi-captive space in China. And so the, the kind of the other weird asterisk on this is that I will also say as an animal caretaker, it is very easy to project personality traits onto your animals as well. So Mm -hmm. It's not as as clear of a measurement as kind of deciding parameters, watching videos, scoring things on a scale, right? So doing a, yeah. a kind of a, a, a squishy personality test questionnaire about tigers filled up by a person who feeds them is, we could do better, but we'll start here. And so okay. what they found was um, that bo- that all the tigers displayed characteristics that separated them out into two overarching personality categories majesty (laughs) and steadiness and so tigers that scored high for majesty were healthier they preyed more on live animals they ate and mated more uh they were also regarded by human raiders as having higher group status among tigers so they were like very like regal demanding got what they needed but uh, steady tigers were collaborative. They were gentler. They um, they were more sincere, severe eye roll, if you can't see me right now, and more loving. <laughs> so, sincere tiger. Yeah. This tiger sincerely wants to eat you. 
Yeah. So the the these traits showed a role for up to two or three years. They could measure kind of the trajectory of this individual based on um, whether they were they were uh, steady or whether they were majestic. And so um, there were benefits to both. There were there were kind of different ways that this would influence their dynamics in the areas, but ultimately. The idea is if you can understand different personality traits and categorize them, you can improve animal welfare and conservation. So, of course, in captivity, you can take better care of an animal if you understand their personality. But also, I think a good animal caretaker is doing that inherently anyway. The really the, the conservation side of things is if you understand the social dynamics of a species in a space, you can understand how much space they need. Who will? Who is likely to win in a fight over territory? Who's going to be the likely uh, dominant uh, breeder in a space, and how will that impact genetics? So there's lots of things yeah. that can come out of knowing personalities and how those personalities impact a species. But, <laughs> um, but. there's a like I said, there's a lot about this story that I think could use some some help. And I think that uh, from a baseline saying that tigers have personality traits that impact their evolutionary success, duh. <laughs> can we can we put that uh, yeah. chart back up there? Is that possible? Oh yeah, give me a give me a there's moment. A, there's a picture yes, of a part. tiger. Yes, I, got, I have a picture that of a looks tiger. like a tiger doing a flemin face, also, which is um, a mating <laughs> response. Uh, so that's very funny to me, but that they chose that. I think somebody <laughs> who picked it was just like, "This is cute." Actually, that tiger, I think, just licked pee, but that's fun. <laughs> I mean, that could be cute, too. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Measuring hormones. <laughs> so something in that measurement did catch my eye, which is that it would have been possible for a tiger to have been identified on the majesty factor uh -huh. as a stupid tiger. Right. <laughs> yes. And on the other side, the, the steadiness, they could have been identified as mysterious. Yes. What? Less yes, mysterious. Yes, you're correct. This is the problem. This is <clears throat> such a squishy, gregarious, yeah. respectful tiger. So also, they like, a bunch of are they like that because of the other conspecifics in the space with them? And might they act differently if there were other individuals around? Do they not like that caretaker? And so they... They they seem aggressive near that caretaker, so that caretaker yeah. has a. It's yes, it is. And right how is problems. how is adaptive uh, on Majesty below savage and imposing, and yet above excellent and positive? And how do you yes. differentiate between excellent and positive? I'm there's sure there's definitely fail. something it's lost in the translation. Positive or negative? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a lot. Yeah, I don't know, man. This this study is, is a bit much, but I just wanted to throw it out there since I, I know it's making the rounds on the internet and I wanted to kind of talk through okay. some of it. But what I'm really excited to talk about this week what is, is wet bird feathers. Okay, Ooh. so this okay. is coming out of John Hopkins University. <laughs> and this is one of those really cool studies looking at natural form and function through evolution and saying, wow, this is really cool. How does it work and how can we use it? And so uh, this is looking at the sand grouse, which is a desert dwelling bird from Africa. They nest about 20 miles from watering holes because watering holes are where all the predators go to drink. And so they have to stay kind of far away um, so that they don't get eaten. And when they have chicks, the adult males will fly to the watering hole. I love this. They will gather wa water in their kind of breast feathers. They just kind of like, like soak. Like a sponge? In. Yes. They, they sponge up water in their breast feathers. And then they fly home with it. They, they gain about 15% of their body weight in water. And wow. then they keep Sick most of it during the 40 mile an hour flight home. That takes about a half an hour. And then when they get home, they uh, the the chicks can can drink water from their chest. So wow. this is this is a crazy thing that happens. Kiki is sharing a video right now. If you're listening to the podcast, I suggest you check out our show notes and look at this video because it shows how not only are these 
feathers extra absorptive like they they suck up water like nothing else but they hold on to it with amazing efficiency so from an engineering perspective everyone's like how does this work yeah <laughs> so what they, they did that? yeah so they used high resolution microscopes 3d technology um they they used scanning electron microscopy, microcomputed tomography, light microscopy, and 3D video- videography. They looked at the shafts. The shafts are a fraction of the width of a human hair. And then the barbules, which are the individual little things coming off the feather shafts, are even tinier than that. And so they're extremely delicate. And then they had to kind of dunk these feathers in water and film it with all these different techniques to try to figure out what's going on. They bend very specifically. They form protective tent-like clusters and tubular structures actually in each barbule capture the water. They like put a lid on it to hold it there. And I'm sure there's some aspect of, um, of, surface tension that's involved as well. So the Mm -hmm. feathers, they wrap around and as they're doing that, they, basically hold a drop of water in and act, you know, create something of a straw. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it's, it kind of has the, has the sucking and then it also has the, the contain, the holding onto it. It doesn't come mm-hmm. off. Um, and so. How does it they, hold on to it? Yeah. They, they first kind of discovered these feathers over 50 years ago, but didn't have the technology to look at it so up close to be able to try to mimic it in real life. And so um, this is kind of the first attempt to demonstrate how the feathers work, really capture it, and then make computational models of the water intake, all so that they could figure out how the controlled absorption, secure retention, and easy release of liquid is possible through these feathers. Um, So this is going to be the next sham wow. Yeah, I'm waiting yeah, for the, so uh, there's a, there's the so Sam many Grouse to use this. Uh, yeah. kitchen commercial. Yeah. yeah, so of course there's, yes, absolutely the sham wow. If we want to talk real um, life changer stuff, netting for collecting and retaining water from fog or dew in deserts or places Ooh. that are that don't have a lot of fresh water could be Very really, really cool. helpful for that. The other one okay. that um, they talked about a bunch in this study was about a water bottle design to prevent swinging and sloshing of water because the idea is you could have like a sports backpack, like a camelback or something. And then if the feather like system was internal, that would keep yeah. the water from swigging around while you, yeah. while you move with it. Um, that sounds I like think, single use. Yeah. Well, yeah. this also yeah. sounds like, yeah, it would harbor bacteria like nothing else. Right. Yeah. yeah. But um, I, I feel yeah. like some of the lead researchers on this do a lot of long haul hiking or running with, with hydration mm-hmm. packs because this is like yeah. such a very specific request. <laughs> specific. <laughs> I, I like, like when water my water sloshes. Like slosh. <laughs> yes. But the other thing that they brought up that I thought was really interesting is medical swabs. So if if any of you have ever taken an at-home COVID test, which I'm guessing pretty much everyone has at this point, mm-hmm. uh, you have to swab your nose and and you you have dip you dip it in a thing and then you have to try to squeeze all of it out right and so um the the retention and then easy release of water is something that medical swabs are not very good at doing so this could create a better medical swab efficiently soaking up liquid and easily releasing it and so the next step for this uh this team is to print 3d structures to try to mimic this to see if they can actually replicate it with with the 3D printed version. So I, I I hope it works. It seems like they have all the information they need, hopefully. I can't wait to see how this all gets used. But I also just love that I didn't know about the sand grouse, which is like the only bird that we know that does this crazy thing to be yeah. able to give their chicks water. I love it. And you know that it is specifically adaptive. Because the stronger males, more capable of flying home with more water, are going to be able to give water to their children better and their offspring will survive better. And so that's, you know, this is something that was selected for. Yes, absolutely. Oh, my feathers are no good. I lost a bunch of water. Now my chicks are going to go thirsty. 
right. You just all survive. 3D printing, huh? I wonder if they'll be yeah. able to do the fine barbules and be able to, if it would be better to 3D print or find another a material that assembles this way naturally. I imagine it's a very expensive, very finely tuned 3D printer. It's not one you're, you got in your garage. My 3D printer could but, not be uh, Yeah. No. <laughs> smaller than a piece of hair, but, you know, it's we'll see. So, Slashy so water we're gonna bottles. Make, we're going to make sand grouse feather-like ma- uh, materials using spider silk. <laughs> yes, and, and, there we go. There. And spiders. And, uh, and then we'll finally have the world's best baby drooly bib. Ooh. That's true. Yes, that's, that's a good a, one. That's yeah. a good one. I just am now imagining, though, Blair's water bottle just being inhabited by spiders because that's <laughs> what keeps the water from sloshing. No, thank you. <laughs> I know. Well, thank you for these fun stories. Yeah. Tigers and wet birds. Who knew that we would be so excited by it? Justin, what do you have for us? Is it, is there, are there still more stories? Oh, gosh. Okay. More to uh, go. This is, uh, Let's do it. Oh, actually, we have to take a break. This is uh, Urgent Alert. Attention. Attention. Incoming friendly reminder message from the folks here at This Week in Science. Eat your broccoli. Okay. That is all. Oh, I had broccoli today. Then you are, you just ate a superfood. Yes. Congratulations. Researchers at Penn State found that broccoli contains certain molecules that bind to a receptor within mice. It's good. This is the reason we study mice. That help protect the lining of the small intestines. This is quoting Gary Perdue, uh, Agricultural Sciences at Penn State. We all know that broccoli is good for us, but why? What happens in the body when we eat broccoli? Our research is helping to uncover the mechanism of how broccoli and other foods benefit health in mice and likely humans as well. It provides strong evidence that cruciferous vegetables such as broccoli, cabbage, and Brussels sprouts should be part of a normal healthy diet. So... It's, Isn't it just the vitamins? I feel like that's that's we already know about this. Like there's so vitamins, no, this there's is iron, a, there's fiber. It's more. <laughs> there's it more to good. the story. So this is yeah. it has a, oh gosh, a molecule called aryl hydrocarbon receptor ligands that binds to hydrocarbon receptors, which is a type of protein uh, called a transcription factor. This binding found, they found initiates a variety of activities that affects the function of intestinal cells. So this has to do with how much uh, moisture passes through the into the from the gut into the body. Uh, so yeah, basically, just eat your broccoli. But they they did test this in mice, and they found in a diet containing fifteen percent broccoli, which for humans would be three and a half cups of broccoli a day. That's it's a lot going, of broccoli. It seems like it's maybe going we a little can hard. Watch broccoli. Maybe yeah, it's we not could that much too much, but it's a little. It's a little. It's a lot. That's a whole meal of every broccoli. day. It, over a day, so you can break it up. Half a cup of broccoli in the morning, then a <laughs> half a cup of broccoli for brunch. Broccoli for then breakfast. A half a cup of broccoli. Oh, we're not even halfway there yet. <laughs> broccoli every <laughs> day. I don't know. I think there are other foods in addition to broccoli that could be eaten in this yeah, way. Yeah, but Brussels sprouts. So you've got to fry those for them <laughs> to basically have any decent flavor. And then they're negating it by yeah. frying it. Yeah. But So the, the, the point in over... This is an overfeeding of broccoli. It's but it's mice, because it, it, also. This is how you highlight effects yes. uh, in a, an animal model. And they found that the, compared to the group that didn't get broccoli, the, the the part that ate their version of three and a half cups of broccoli per day, 15% of their diet and broccoli a day, were much healthier mice. Uh, they had altered intestinal barrier functions, reduced transit time of food in the small intestines, decreased number of globulate cells and uh, protective mucus, and decreased penith cells and lysosome production in the ones that didn't get it. So, eat your broccoli, kids. Eat your broccoli, everybody. Okay. And just like Dana Carvey used to do, 
Make sure you're chopping broccoli. Nobody's good. That's broccoli. a reference. That's a reference. That's a reference I from know. so long ago. 30, so 40 years ago. Long ago. Shush, shush. Okay, next story. Hush. <laughs> Uh, an analysis of strands of human hair from a burial site in Menorca, Spain, indicates that ancient humans used hallucinogenic drugs derived from plants. These findings are the first direct evidence of ancient drug use in Europe, which don't say ritualistic use. Don't say ritualistic use. Don't say ritualistic use. What are they going to say? May have been used as part of ritualistic ceremonies. Great. It's like they can't help themselves. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Previous evidence of prehistoric drug use in Europe has been based on indirect evidence, such as the detection of opium alkaloids in Bronze Age containers and the findings of uh, some drug plant rich in, uh, plants in ritualistic contexts and the appearance of drug plants in artistic depictions. Hey, I'm throwing a ritualistic context this weekend, and I want to invite you. Oh, you can make it? Oh, that's great. Hey, my artistic <laughs> depiction device is on the fritz. Would you mind bringing some cave paint? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll see you here on sundown. Yeah, why, why is it that that, uh, that when we find out that uh, ancient people used drugs, it has to be for a reason? <laughs> it must be, it must be that this anthropologists never get invited to parties. <laughs> this is the only thing that I can under... Like, they have such a... Like, like we, we, we talked about this previously. There was a study that, uh, that uh, these little owl... Uh, depictions that were found yeah. all throughout Europe and all these different sites were, were ritualistic burial tributes uh, is what they had been called for it. And then at some point we figured out uh, these are likely kids toys made by children that they played with, you know, but, but for the longest time, these are ritualistic ceremonial, da, 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 like everything. And it doesn't matter where in the world you are. It does not matter where in the world you are. It's, maybe it's for as long as we have our written, you know, Western human history. The special drugs have been monitored and only been in use by the religious hierarchy, the top of the religious hierarchy for ritualistic religious use. I mean, you know, this but is when I know, but this is the story. In our recorded oh. history, who, what, what, what religion is there? Where there's priests and shamans and they're the only ones doing the drugs. Like, this this is not how any of it ever were, has worked. Only there, the, the, yes, only there the are... Only the precious few. There are traditions that use uh, drugs in a, you know... Ritualistic semi -ceremonial way. Semi-ceremonial way. But mm -hmm. that's in the current day and age where they're revisiting things that people used to do. And if it wasn't under that, by the way... For some of those, the only way they're allowed to continue those practices in the modern world is by calling them ceremonial rituals. Otherwise, yeah. it would be forbidden from doing right. so. So anyway, this is exactly. uh, researchers examined the strands of hair from a cave in Menorca, which it's was first occupied hair. about 3,600 years ago. They so it was kind of interesting. And it was contained... There was a chamber of the cave that was used as funeral space until around 2,800 years ago. Previous research suggested about 210 individuals were interred in the chamber. However, strands of hair only from certain individuals were dyed red, placed in a wooden horn container, and decorated with concentric circles, removed to a separate sealed chamber further back in the cave, and these hair strands dated to about 3,000 years ago. Interesting. Hey, wouldn't it be like wild if thousands of years from now somebody could look at our hair and figure out that we were high? <laughs> like they would use like, I don't know, like a special kind of water or something. I'm, I'm going to set some aside in this groovy container and like put it way in the back and dye it red so they it is know what yeah, to look at okay. when they find it. So it is, this is, this is, why would you put a, a, a mat of over five centimeters of hair <laughs> that you've dyed in a special carved 
container. Time capsule. A time capsule. Okay, fine. Yeah. I don't know. I just. That's my, I'm yeah, Fada says it's an ancient uh, salon. The hair yeah. salon. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, we have to test the, str- the a little bit of the hair to make sure that the dye is going to take right and mm-hmm. not, you know, mm-hmm. damage your hair too much. The authors used ultra high performance liquid chromatography and high resolution mass spectroscopy to test for the presence of different alkaloids. They've uh, they found them. They found uh, a whole bunch. I won't list them. Definitely hallucinogenics from back in the oldy times. But uh, this said, and the author suggests these drug plants may have been u- may have been used as part of ritual ceremonies performed by a shaman. Because no matter where in the world an anthropologist is studying party people of the past, they always, always, always imagine them the same way. Shaman is code for drug dealer, right? I assume in this case. <laughs> <laughs> it's the person that came the with sacred, the supply the sacred person hey are yeah. you, uh, you heading to the ceremonial context this weekend yeah hey uh can i do you mind if i hit up your shaman yes Mine, exactly. mine's, a, uh, mine's <laughs> like sort of out of the <laughs> off the circuit at the moment he's on a pilgrimage you know yeah he's pilgrim hey, he's doing one of those on the shelf pilgrimages kind of things yeah, yeah. Oh goodness. <laughs> well, you know, I can't wait to find out, you know, what what future anthropologists will say, archaeologists will say about our various It's almost like a reverse anthropomorphization. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what I was gonna say. That's, I didn't yeah. want to go on a whole thing, but there are animals a that, <laughs> that that you know, there are birds that eat fermented berries off the ground and get drunk they're they're animals that essentially do drugs they're not doing a spiritual ritual <laughs> it's just like oh this makes me feel funny i'm gonna have do you, it again yeah have you seen your yeah. cat roll around in catnip yes uh, yes or you know, there is evidence of birds and other animals using herbs and other plants found in the environment for Absolutely. keeping Keeping their houses clean, keeping the bugs. Not away. to knock it. Not yeah. that you can't yeah. uh, do it this way, but assuming that that's what's going on in every incident. Yeah. No. Yep. Yeah. Assumptions, huh? Mm-hmm. Those are. What do those do? Yeah. <sighs> Well, not making assumptions, I just want to go very, very quickly through a couple of quick finds. Salk Research Institute scientists have just published uh, their findings in the frontiers in aging neuro- in aging neuroscience. Um, their studies uh, looking into the synaptic boutons the synapses how do the synapses connect to each other and what happens in aging to the synapses well they have determined that there is a scaling law and this is something that has been previously determined years ago that the size of the the synapse is related to the distance between one side of the synapse to the other it is related to the size of the mitochondria that are in the synapse in the cellular terminals that are coming together. The mitochondria need to be a certain size, putting out a certain amount of energy, and it all relates based on size. They, in this particular study, were able to show that this size law starts to fail as people get older. And whether it's uh, just dysfunctioning mitochondria, that the mitochondria are failing, there's something that's happening at the synapse, at the point where our neural connections are being made that is causing dysfunction. And so they're, from this research, looking at directly focusing on the mitochondria, as we've talked about before, as one of the targets to maintain healthy aging and healthy synapses in the brain. Yeah, and and, and that is that throughout the cellular body. Throughout the, the whole person, yes. <laughs> mitochondria is going to be the thing that they're talking about is going to be uh, mitochondrial transplantation. 
It's not going to... Yeah, this is the cool. only way. This is the only way we're going to get to this uh, Blair living forever situation. Yes. Is because it's too late to genetically alter you. And we're only starting research that can do that through this workaround that we discovered 20 years after the research was halted for religious reasons. We're not going... It's too late to, to, to alter any of our genes or our children's genes to, to live forever. The closest thing that we're going to get is going to be mitochondrial transplantation. Because Possibly. This, or, or if we can just figure out if, if we don't transplant them, how can, what, are the, what are the signals? What are the molecules? What are the receptors? What are the things that we need to do? What are the bacteria that we need to have in our tummies well, to, re, to get all the metabolites and all the nutrients to make sure that our mitochondria stay healthy and stay yeah. fit and keep powering the cell? And one of the one of the things the the reason I say mitochondrial transplant it doesn't mean that you take one out and put one in. There is a natural fusion thing that mitochondria do, where you put more mitochondria in, and they'll they snap together and they go, oh, hey, you know, part of you isn't working. Let me take over this. Right. Let me take over That's these true. duties. And they, That's how they, they kind of came to be anyway. Hmm? Right. Mitochondria were just a, a, a this. Ma this captured important bacteria. organelle, they're captured bacteria, right? Yeah. Oh, this little part. I'll just do this for you. <laughs> we'll help each other out. They do. They, they're they're yeah. uh, amazing at it. You know. I, anyway, this is that's a side tangent, but that's where I think the the future of everything is mitochondria. That's the one <laughs> thing that sh should be studied for every disease, for for yeah. everything to do with aging, for every kind of cancer, for everything. It's all going to come down to. Healthy mitochondria. So yeah. promoted from the powerhouse of the cell to the future of everything. Got it. The powerhouse of the cell, but it's, <laughs> it's not just the powerhouse. But it's also the the everything else. All it's like a lot of the the crucial proteins and and it has genetic uh, information. Right? RNA. There's, yeah, there's a whole all bunch of cool of that is really dependent on a healthy yes. functioning mitochondria, which has this amazing ability to heal. With the introduction of, of uh, healthy mitochondria. Yeah. Well, these researchers, they were able to study uh, the synapse using electron microscopy. They were able to vi visualize the components that were incorporated within the synapse to be able to see whether or not this scaling law, whether it could be violated in age or in disease. And really, the researchers... Um, the lead researcher Reynolds says the images we have captured of synapses are snapshots of a dynamic process with these snapshots in hand. We can begin to think first about the mechanisms that coordinate the expansion and contraction of the various parts of the synaptic complex, then ask how disruption of these mechanisms can explain age related cognitive decline. This opens an entirely new way of thinking about cognitive decline that could lead to new targets for future therapeutics. So mitochondria targeting and Yes, active, dynamic, synapse, connect complexes. How do we keep them healthy? Uh, and my final story for the night, I would like to talk about some wonderful researchers who have uh, just published their work in Nature Methods. Their, uh, their work at ICFO, this research institute, uh, they are... Taking optogenetics to the next level. Like, really, truly taking optogenetics to the next level. So we've talked about optogenetics previously as a way of controlling cellular function by incorporating light-sensitive receptors into neurons or cells and then being able to trigger the use light, like usually blue light can also be red light, but usually blue light that is able to trigger those light sensitive receptors to then cause some kind of action to take place. People have been talking is it, about is it blue light? One of one of them penetrates deeper into the brain. I can't remember. I, think I believe it's, it's red. Light. The red light goes deeper, but it's not as specific. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, the. Um, they looked at this and they're like, huh, that's interesting. Okay, so we've got electro, uh, electrical transmission, electrochemical transmission in neurons and synapses. We've got 
uh, light transmission that's happening in the synapses, but why don't we put these together and we'll make neurons that emit light to trigger other neurons. So let's make light a neurotransmitter. Let's turn photons into neurotransmitters. Wait, doesn't that just turn us into robots? <laughs> Sounds like it, yes. Uh, so this is the photon-assisted syn synaptic transmission system. And it is based on uh, luciferase, which is found at lucifer luciferin, which is found in fireflies and is the light that can be emitted. And then also channel rhodopsins, which is are the receptive light re uh, light receptive uh, molecules that proteins that are in our eyes. And so these luciferases and channel rhodopsins. In different, neuro, in different neurons, we're able to work together to create actual circuits in a living organism in C. elegans, the little worm, the lab model, the worm that could. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they initially created these C. elegans worms with a, with a nutrici with nutritional deficit. So they didn't have a certain uh, glutamate uh, nu nutrient in their diet. And so the FAST system in the C. elegans led to, they, they, booped the wor they booped the worms on the noses to stimulate the neural like sensory process, <laughs> which is like a pain signal. Hey, boop. I boop your nose worm. And so then the worms would want to move away from the nose boop. And they couldn't if unless this unless this particular system activated. And so they they fixed the nutrient deficit by creating this system that worked and they were able to, yeah. So yeah. Yes, they were able to put different systems together. And it's I just I'm amazed by this the whole concept of what they've done here. I mean, but yeah. According according to the researchers, it's inter inter interesting to use light as a messenger because uh, it could be used in other uh, interesting ways to help un understand underlying mechanisms of brain function and complex behaviors, of course, of course. Um, it could lead to new treatments. I mean, I don't know. Do you, yeah. Do we want that? Uh, could it help repair brain damaged brain surgeries without invasive surgeries? It's a far way to go from C. elegans to human oh, brains, but uh, so absolutely, that's what I first thought of was just kind of repairing brain damage by replacing neurons with essentially fiber optics. With fiber, it, it is like fiber optics. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, could you create? Uh, yeah, could you create a system where you know you're not a worm, where it actually would work right. to connect? You know. Neuron to neuron, light transmitted instead of chemicals. Isn't that how Data's brain worked in Star Trek? He had a positronic was... brain, I remember. But whenever they opened up his head, there were always lots of lights flashing. Yeah. Yeah. First thing we need to do to improve <laughs> humanity is get rid of the brain. <laughs> Just get rid of what? No, don't get rid of the brain. We like the brain. Just enhance a, with flashing wonderful. lights, as you often do. <laughs> Look, I do not need my brain flashing like the computer next to me. This is it's, it's more like a rave, you know, distracting, distracting enough. Oof, I know. Oof, oof, oof. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, researchers using light as neurotransmitters. And that's where they're going now, and it's very exciting. And I don't know what are they going to do with it. That is the Who question. Knows? And it's, it's not called a rave anymore, <laughs> by the not. way. Oh, it's a ritual. No, it's ritualistic context. <laughs> You're right. Now, You're right. What they now call it. I'm sorry. Ritualistic music? M music session? I don't know. Ritualistic context. Session. Session. <laughs> <laughs> have we made it to the end of the show? We've I done it. We may have. 
I think we have made it as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another episode of Twists. We are so glad you've been here. I want to give a few shout outs to people who help with the show. Fada, definitely thank you for your help on social media and show notes. Really wonderful to get your help getting the word out about the show. Gord and Arn Lore and others who are in the various chat rooms, thank you for being there and being friendly. To all the other chatters, thank you for being there too and for chatting with us. And we love it that you're here in the YouTubes and the Twitches and the Facebooks and you're here while we are and we get to interact, even though we don't always interact with you. We're watching, we're paying attention. Uh, additionally, Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you so much for your work editing. And I would love to, of course, thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Teresa Smith, R James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazarb, George Chorus, John Radniswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard, Chef's Dad, Hal Steider, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan, Don Mundus, Stephen Albaran, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, David e. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hassenblow, Steve Leesman, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E. Oak, Adam Mishkon, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Codler, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Picararo, and Tony Steele. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you would like to become a Patreon sponsor, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link. On next week's show, we will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And again at 5 a.m. Central European time on Thursday. Broadcasting live from Thank our you. YouTube and Thank Facebook you. channels and from twist.org slash live. Want to listen to us as a podcast? Perhaps as you fiddle with the positronic brain of your Android friend? Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes, links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org, where you can also sign up for a newsletter. You can also contact us directly, email Kiki at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. That's me. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will actually get sent to a Roomba who's very angry at us and will never tell us about it. Oh, no. You can, I guess, still reach us via the Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science this week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. science. this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science.